Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, the 22nd of February, 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in studio, Mike Robinson. Well, it's very wet and windy, grey, dismal here in uh, Plymouth, and we seem to be getting that as reports from across the country. So uh, commiserations if you're suffering along with us. Well, let's come on to the remarkable um, story that uh, former British uh, Prime Minister Ted Heath was a paedophile. And uh, we'll bring this uh, slide up on screen. Bottom left is uh, just one of the many headlines, uh, but this is the Mail. The Daily Mail seems to have some problem understanding how serious the uh, Wiltshire police investigation into this is. And we'd like to remind people, of course, that our very own BBC filmed footage of Tim Fortescue, who was a uh, Conservative whip during the Ted Heath period. And uh, Mr Fortescue can be seen in this YouTube film clip saying that they, politicians and members of parliament, came to the whips with any sort of scandal. It could be small boys. And we helped them because uh, they would then do as we asked. So, Mike, we've got, uh, we've got one of Heath's whips on screen recorded by the BBC saying, yes, MPs were abusing boys, but we didn't tell the police. We covered it up, fixed it so that we could blackmail them. But remarkably, the Daily Mail senior reporter Simon Walters doesn't seem to be able to pick up on this. Uh, BBC doesn't seem to be able to report on it. And no other newspaper in the country is reporting on it. Well, what can you say? I mean, there's not much to say about it. The standard of reporting, I mean, we're going to cover this a little bit more as we go through the programme, but the standard of reporting from the mainstream media just continues to plummet. A willful blind eye to the fact that we have a massive problem with the abuse of children by people in uh, the establishment places of high political power, uh, but the media's response is to simply not talk about it. Well, let's move on to the good news. And the good news, of course, is that banks are here to help us. And thank you very much to the person who sent this little article through to us. It's the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development. And it's advertising that uh, they've got a conference on breaking stereotypes, paving the way for equality. And I'll explain the uh, picture. Uh, this is what it's all about. International Women's Day 2017, EBRD invites you to breaking stereotypes, paving the way to equality, a discussion event on the challenges and barriers women face to access employment in traditionally male-dominated sectors. And according to the bank, data shows that the gender gap won't close before 2186, a date, that's the date. But uh, after the event, they're showing the film uh, that was the little screenshot for that, Mike. They're showing the film, uh, which is The Eagle Huntress. And uh, this is uh, about a girl in Mongolia, Mongolia who wanted to compete in this, uh, this event. So, I w <coughs> excuse me, I've got trouble with that frog again. Um, I was very encouraged that we're clearly seeing that we can relax because the international banks and banking interests, European um, banking uh, for reconstruction and development here, is looking after our future, the role of families, men and women. I think we can relax, Mike. Um, well, it's interesting. Sorry, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, because uh, I noticed UBS getting involved in this as well. And I was just saying to Vanessa Bailey earlier today that uh, it is fascinating that, you know, in the past, banks have pumped money into various NGOs uh, and so on to bring about foundations, to bring about social change. They now seem to be getting involved in that direct, uh, directly. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is because they see this as being some kind of PR uh, thing for them or whether they feel that the NGOs aren't doing a sufficient job, but certainly they seem to be uh, becoming much more directly involved in some of these things. Uh, that's certainly the case. And we're going to dig into the, um, uh, the British Council again, because we can see this banking influence under the surface of the British Council. Well, before we do, uh, let's just mention uh, UK Aid and hashtag Global Britain, uh, because um, this is uh, pretty Patel at her work. Uh, and here we have um, the uh, infographic that uh, UK Aid has pushed out today. The UK Department for International Development has pushed out today. Uh, and they're saying before this week, there has only been one certified famine globally since 2000. 
parts of Sudan are now in famine, and in 2017, there is a credible risk of another three famines in Yemen, northeast Nigeria, and Somalia. And they're saying drought and conflict in these countries are pushing families to the brink of starvation. As the world faces an unprecedented number of humanitarian crises, the UK will lead the world in supporting famine-stricken areas. Now, what's fascinating about this is that, uh, at least to my mind, is that in the past, whenever there's been a famine or some other humanitarian crisis, uh, the crisis would take place. We'd see coverage of it in the mainstream media. And then uh, there would be calls for intervention from government and aid money going to those places. Uh, in fact, if you look at these uh, areas that they're talking about, South Sudan, Somalia, northeastern Nigeria and Yemen, these are all places that the Department for International Development has already intervened. Uh, so what they're saying is that they're now predicting famine in the future uh, despite current intervention or perhaps because of current intervention. Uh, you may have a, a view on this. Uh, but here's uh, what Priti Patel had to say. In times of crisis, the world looks to Britain, not just for our work on the ground, but also for our leadership internationally. So that's sterling words from her. But I think there's some questions that she needs to answer as to why, when we're pumping millions of pounds into these areas already, um, that they are facing this, these types of humanitarian crises. Uh, could it be, uh, as I suspect, that we are creating these crises? Uh, through the use of our, our aid money in these countries? Well, Mike, that's uh, absolutely what I believe. We can we consider BBC Media Action, which boasts that it's going into countries to help transform their society. So people who are being transformed and changed aren't going to be focused on their uh, traditional important roles. Let's say that's agriculture. You, you are now attacking the family units that have been used to working the land. You're dividing men against women. So that is automatically going to have an effect. Um, we are promoting the arts and culture. Uh, was it in uh, Somalia or Yemen? We had them um, funding uh, an all-female pop group. Well, that isn't going to help you feed yourself, but this is the promotion of arts and leadership is not getting out on the ground and running a country. Mm -hmm. So we could say that's soft power. And of course, hard power is that if you start subversion and uh, active destabilization of countries. Uh, Syria, classic example, because we can show BBC media action boasting that it was helping to destabilize the Assad regime. So we, we've got the fermenting of um, unrest in a country followed by uh, fighting and uh, war. Um, countries are automatically going to fall into famine. So Let's follow this line by going back in to have a look at um, the British Council. Now, we always say to people, don't believe what we say, go and have a look at the websites uh, yourself. Well, here's the British Council. And uh, of course, what is it saying? It says it's independent, it says it's apolitical, uh, but its objective is to spread British influence worldwide. And they're boasting that they're now active in more than 100 countries. So uh, I thought we'd have a little look again at what they're about, and we're going to have a look at some of the people. Uh, so this was part of a diagram that we had yesterday, giving you a flavour for them. Uh, they're, talking, uh, they're talking about uh, bringing prosperity. They're talking about transforming national education systems. Uh, but in the background, we have international banks and high finance. We have corporations and wealth creation. And we've also got wealth creation from children. I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, we've got links through to the BBC and indeed links to BBC Media Action and very strong links through to the European Union. Well, we challenged the British Council on their statements to do with the European Union, uh, particularly post-Brexit. So let's have a look at uh, how that occurred. We'd had a look at their part of the web page here, which is the British Council saying it's organisationally apolitical. And we're interested in the paragraph that we've uh, highlighted there with the red arrow. So if we bring this up on screen, as we read through it, uh, we see that it says in the final part, the British Council believes that it's important that the UK remains an active and constructive member of major international institutions such as the Commonwealth, UN Security Council and the European Union. 
Well, when we challenge them on the fact they're saying we're going to remain a member of the European Union, they got in quite a fluster and uh, let's see what happened. Well, what happened was they rewrote that uh, part of their website so that it now reads, and we continue to work with the governments of Europe on culture, arts, science and education. And I'll just, I'll just push the point here, Mike, it's nothing to do with people feeding themselves. So what was the European Union has now become the governments of Europe. So this would lead us to believe that basically the British Council is now going to work with governments of nation states in Europe. But of course this is a complete lie uh, because if we come back to a major part of the work they're doing is promoting the Erasmus programme of moving European students all around the European Union. This isn't a program of European nation states. This is a European Union program and the British Council use the word agent. We act as an agent for this. So I don't know about you, Mike, but I'm confused now as to where we stand on this because apparently the British Council was pro-EU. Suddenly it's not. And to prove it to the public, they adjust the wording on the website. So they've changed one line on the website. Uh, chat box reminding us that, of course, British Council and Common Purpose, uh, hand in glove. Absolutely. And uh, so, you know, this is this is you're not going to get any kind of uh, honesty out of them on, on what their true agenda is, I think. No, but it was interesting to see the effect that phone call had. So let's get into the British Council and no better place to go than to actually look at the people driving it. Now, I'd like longer, but we've only got our news today. But we worked our way through the um, trustees and also the executive board and we've got some very interesting people with interesting backgrounds. Christopher Rodriguez here uh, used to work for Visa, McKinsey & Co, Financial Services Authority. We're basically dealing with banking interests here, Mike. Uh, we've got uh, your favourite, um, uh, Baroness uh, Prashar. Um, Ditchley Foundation, Runnymede Trust. These are change agencies, uh, but she's also heading up the Royal Commonwealth Society. So huge linked interests for this organization says it's independent uh, we've got this young lady deborah and um, uh, she's been involved in the foreign and commonwealth office uh, the organization says it's independent from government uh, this is completely untrue so she's worked at the foreign and commonwealth office she's been working in the eu she's been working with g8 how can these people possibly say they're independent uh, we've got this gentleman, Gareth Bullock, Standard Charter, Fleming Family, British Bankers Association, banker. And then it gets interesting because uh, we've got Rosamund Marshall here and uh, uh, we're going to have a look in depth at her, education and childcare for profit. And it gets really spooky if we have a look at this gentleman. I'll call him up on screen again. But basically he's into IT and mindfulness. So um, let's remember what the British Council says it's doing is just spreading British influence around the globe. But I think there's something very much bigger and uh, deeper going on. So here's Rosamond, and we can bring that up on screen. 30 years of management experience in education-based businesses. Uh, most recent role was chief executive of Kids Unlimited, the fourth largest nursery schools operator in UK, which was sold the Bright Horizons Family Solution. This is dealing with children, Mike, but it's also to do with profit, increasing that profit, selling the companies on. And then previously, she was Chief Operating Officer of Nord Anglia Education PLC, and that actually gets uh, sold on to, to Bearings Bank. So I, I get a very uneasy feeling here. Let's have a look at the other gentleman, if we bring him in. Uh, Rowan um, Gun to Lake, if I pronounce that correctly. And this is really spooky stuff. Producer, entrepreneur, specialisms in digital innovation in the arts and how technology can improve well being, digital tools, digital thinking, big money. Uh, his second specialism is understanding how popular technologies might create joy, focus, and calm instead of distress, distraction, and anxiety. And he's the creator of Budify, the mobile mindfulness app for modern life. And he's in with the BBC. 
I had trouble actually pronouncing some of that because the wording, it, it's becoming increasingly bizarre as to what these people are, uh, are doing. Are they out to say what Britain is as a nation? Are they out to change other societies to introduce a Buddhist app to, to make you joyful? Or is this, is this the Mad Hatter's Tea Party disguised uh, as an extremely wealthy non-government organization run by the government? Right, so, so again, we have this situation where, um, tech, where, in this case, we're gonna use technology to persuade us that we're happy, even if we're not. And we're not gonna provide any kind of productive career Job or just about any satisfaction. Things, it's, building things. It's gonna be, it's gonna be just, uh, you know, making sure that you feel happy through technology. Yeah, but this isn't gonna be afflicted just on people in UK. No, this is the policy to go into a hundred other countries, uh, get in amongst their culture and government society, destabilize it, introduce this utter dross, and then when they can't feed themselves and they're running around in circles, uh, then we're gonna claim that we've helped them. Uh, well, let's have a look um, because the, uh, British Council came back to me. It's only fair that I should say they did send me an email. I'll just read you a bit of this. Uh, it says, thanks for the call. I've raised the problem of the outdated wording on our website with our web team, and we will replace it to reflect the British Council's position on Brexit. And the position was laid out at the launch of our G20 survey in mid-December, and then they've given me some extracts of this. Uh, the first bit I'll read, the second bit we'll have a look at on screen. It says the British Council, the UK's international organisation for cultural relations and educational opportunities, is calling for an open Brexit in which the UK seeks to maintain and step up its people-to-people -people connections with other European nations and beyond. This would include continued ease of movement for students, academics and creative professionals increased cultural, educational, scientific partnership, connections and research, and enhanced investment into the UK's cultural and educational connections with countries globally. Do you understand all that? So we are going to carry on as normal, but we're gonna make sure that the European Union Erasmus program continues, and we're gonna get this educational arts, well-being tech agenda into over 100 company, uh, countries. So uh, the second part of the email was a quote from the chief executive, Kieran Devan, and uh, he says this, as the UK comes to reposition itself on the world stage, our reputation matters more than ever. We need to address the more negative opinions young people in Europe now have while making the most of the positive opinions elsewhere. What businesses have asked what, what um, young Europeans think of UK? Are, are these young Europeans not capable of making up their own mind? Well, it's a reasonable question. I have to ask it. But apparently we're going to spend millions on trying to reframe the minds of young European uh, students, presumably, who don't really understand what's happened with Brexit. Uh, well, have a look, because he goes on. He says here, Leaving the EU in a way that maintains relationships with the societies of Europe and that strengthens these partnerships around the world will be essential. Now, I don't know what this man's talking about. Is he talking about social societies or is he talking about elitist political societies? Very ambiguous wording, uh, but I'm going to say I do not get a warm feeling from the words this man is using. And one more to make sure we really know what's being said. An open Brexit can use these connections to forge new bonds globally, as well as continue the centuries of cooperation with the nations of Europe in science, education, business, and the arts. So life's gonna continue as normal. And um, what is his experience for running half the world through the British Council? Um, he was chief executive of McMahon Cancer Support he worked at ICI and he's been a consultant through Gemini and he's very big in change management, AstraZeneca and Rolls-Royce. So you jump out of a cancer charity into a British government organization which is gonna change the world. Brilliant. Okay, well, let's uh, move on to, well, Russia. Russia is the, uh, the source of all our problems, apparently. Um, 
maybe we're going to get an app for that, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is all about conflict in Europe. Now, Matthew Rycroft was speaking in the United Nations yesterday, didn't say anything uh, whatsoever about the passing of uh, uh, the uh, Russian ambassador to the UN, uh, but that's okay. What he did say was he was describing the, uh, how Britain has been at the, the forefront of, the, uh, of keeping peace in Europe since the Second World War. Um, he said that the three organizations, the United Nations, the OSCE, and the European Union are all playing a crucial role to preserving peace and security in Europe. Everything that they do uh, in the Security Council, he says, has come about as a direct result of conflict in Europe over seven decades on from the Second World War. Uh, we should all be proud that Europeans now enjoy a level of stability and prosperity that would have been unthinkable to our grand grandparents' generation. Um, and as we heard so clearly in the session on Ukraine early in this month, uh, stability, instability and insecurity persists in Europe. Uh, the borders of Europe are threatened today in a way not seen since the Cold War. The territorial integrity of our country, Mr. President, he said, has been flagrantly violated, uh, leave, leaving up to 10,000 dead and millions displaced. At the heart of this disregard for sovereignty lies the Russian Federation and its worldview that thinks Moscow's interests should prevail over the sovereign and democratic choices of independent countries. Brian, I read this, I heard what he said, and I nearly fell off my chair because how is it possible for somebody who's apparently a top diplomat in Britain, how is it possible for anybody that's supposedly intelligent to come off with a statement like that, which is so unbelievably hypocritical, uh, and keep a straight face? I don't know how he does it. Um, I think he must require some kind of medical intervention in he, order to do it. He's lost a single strand of hair for each lie that he's told. I, I think there's a bit of a clue from the picture. Um, Rank hypocrisy, Mike. If, if we had the Russian council uh, pumping out these programs in, all these, in 100 countries overseas, or we had uh, BBC Global boasting about bringing its propaganda into, I think it's now two, 300 million people, uh, huge numbers of people. Um, if the Russians were doing that, maybe he's got a leg to stand on. But he is the problem. He's part of the problem. Absolutely. So let's see what else he had to say. Put simply, he said, we can't stand idly by in the face of such aggression. This council, the Security Council, has a responsibility to sustain the peace won in Europe seven decades ago to ensure that the rules-based international order, most notably the UN Charter, is respected and upheld by all countries. Uh, we have a responsibility to ensure that wars waged across battlefields are ended through dialogue pursued across tables. NATO has responded in a coherent, comprehensive way. I can't really read any more of this. Uh, and he ended up by saying, we speak clearly to say that we do not and will not recognize the illegal annexation of Crimea. I am proud to do so again today on behalf of the United Kingdom. Well, Mr. Rycroft, you have not said that on behalf of me. I live in the United Kingdom and I don't think uh, that you're worth uh, the air that you breathe. But anyway, let's move on because uh, David Davis reinforcing this message. Uh, because he was visiting Baltic leaders to discuss, discuss future relations between uh, Britain and the Baltics. He was particularly, he was in Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, and uh, he was saying that Britain will continue to work with the Baltic regions, Baltic countries, sorry, on areas such as joint defence and security. He said a global Britain is determined to maintain its historic relations with Europe after leaving the European Union. Uh, he, he was there for, for two days on, uh, this is Wednesday, on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, and he met the heads of government. Uh, he said the UK is leaving the European Union, not Europe. We're looking to maintain our close ties with the Baltic states and all our European allies, and will continue to commit to mutual interests such as trade, justice, defence and security. He said uh, the UK has led European action on keeping our continent safe, whether implementing sanctions against Russia, following its aggressive action in Ukraine, or securing Europe's uh, external border. Such partnership continues to be of vital importance and particularly in the face of growing concern about the threat of security across the continent. Um, well, let's not leave it there because back in Parliament, uh, this gent, Chris Bryant, Labour MP, uh, famous for photographs of himself in his underpants uh, that reached the mainstream media, uh, he decided that we should keep the uh, pressure on Russia within Parliament. He said that it's clear evidence uh, of Russian direct corrupt involvement in elections in France and Germany, in the United States of America, and I would argue also in country in this country in Britain. Now, of course, he didn't provide any 
uh, evidence to back up that statement. So what that clear evidence is, I have no idea. Well, I think um, we can ask our uh, audience today, Mike, to challenge Chris Bryant directly on this. UK column originally challenged Brooks Newmark when he claims that uh, Assad had used chemical weapons. He said that was a fact. We challenged him to provide the evidence, and of course he couldn't. No evidence has ever been provided uh, that that is the case. And here we've got similar claims being made. People should be emailing this man, ringing him at Parliament, and ask him to provide the um, evidence to support what he says. It'll be interesting. Watch what happens. Well, let's see what else he said. He said, many, many believe that some of the highest level decisions affecting security in the United Kingdom and Germany and France and the United States are now compromised by Russian infiltration. So it's gone from clear evidence to many believe already. Uh, and then he went on to say, my personal perception is that both David Cameron and President Obama were very reluctant uh, to show a strong arm to Russia because they thought by pressing the reset button, that was Obama's view, somehow or other, you would manage to get major concessions out of Putin. I have to say that that's simply not proved to be an effective strategy. In every single regard, Putin has simply taken those moments as a sign of weakness and proceeded to use force to a greater degree. And again, more absolutely sheer and rank hypocrisy here. Uh, but well, don't forget he's a common purpose man. Uh, uh, Mike, let's not forget that. Uh, absolutely. A bit uh, of theology there as well. Uh, and uh, of course, let's not leave it to parliamentarians or politicians because the media absolutely getting, abs I mean, this is, if, if you're listening to this on, on uh, Alternate Current Radio or, or on the podcast, do get onto the video and just look at this or look up this article on The Guardian. It's got, the, the headline is Killer, Kleptocrat, Genius, Spy, The Many Myths of Vladimir Putin. It's, it's uh, well, I don't even know how to describe it, Brian. Uh, well, uh, if people want to go and have a look at that, and I think they should, because it's just outrageous what's going on in the uh, British press, never mind overseas press. We can also see some excellent videos of uh, talks, uh, media talks given by President Putin, where he is absolutely describing the decline of the UK and Western states, um, disappearing into lawlessness, and of course the rise of, of the paedophiles controlling the country. So Putin is warning um, his own people about the fact that uh, the West is increasingly being run by criminals and paedophiles. And I have to say, I totally agree with the comments that he's making. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, have a look at the Times front page this morning. Um, really what I'm going to talk about is, is the headline, Britain will stay open to EU migrants, Steve Davis admits. Uh, but I couldn't let this one go without passing remark on uh, on Boris Johnson there, who's looking particularly fetching in his pyjamas. This, this uh, Mike, I'm sure that this is deliberate. Many people look at it, they say this man is a complete idiot and buffoon. I don't think he's an idiot and a buffoon. I think he's an extremely calculating and dangerous in individual. Yeah, the but buffoonery the, is a front. The buffoonery is, of course, demeaning the British public because this man is supposed to be representing the, the British public. He is there looking like some sort of clown, uh, possibly a drunken clown. Uh, this, is, this is simply um, undermining all, all the, it's undermining the British public. And people haven't yet woken up to what's really going on here, but uh, very dangerous psychological stuff. Uh, but anyway, David Davis, um, in, as we say in Latvia, was uh, explaining about how, you know, we immigration policy isn't going to change post-Brexit in any way, shape or form, not for years and years and years, if ever. Uh, he said that uh, handling immigration is going to be a gradual process. It'll take some time. Uh, yesterday, I said it will take years. Don't expect just because we're changing uh, who makes a decision on policy that the door will suddenly shut. It won't. Um, and th this comes back to this whole business um, that the simplest way, they argue, uh, of dealing with Brexit is to fold all the European legislation, turn it, convert it into domestic legislation and start off from there. And I believe, and I believe that this um, reflects my position here, I believe that Britain's uh, legislation agenda as time passes will simply stay in sync with that of the European Union. And uh, whether we are out in name or not is an irrelevance.
Yeah, and the British Council's confirmed this because it's saying we're going to continue to work with all of these societies. Uh, we're going to continue to help the European Union uh, progress its educational programme across borders. So it's, it's Brexit, but there is no Brexit. It's the big scam. Well, if you are beginning to feel fired up at some of the UK column news articles, then we're going to say to you, um, join many other people who are now getting increasingly frustrated that their MPs simply betraying them, not taking the right action, not telling the truth, not standing up to get rid of the paedophile element out of British Parliament. And uh, what have we got here? Well, we've got the opportunity on the 22nd of April to bring uh, 950 people together in one room to share information about what's happening in UK and what each and every one of you have been doing to um, help stop that. And I've put a comment here that this is for our families, it's for each other, of, uh, for each of us, it's for our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren possibly. These children don't have a future unless we put a stop to what is going on in UK at the moment. Um, and let's uh, mention David Scott's uh, um, meeting on Thursday, the March the 30th, uh, Gillard Atzman and David Scott in Glasgow uh, at the uh, Templeton building in Glasgow, G41AW, 7.30, uh, sorry, sorry, 7 o'clock to 9.30 p.m. Thursday, March the 30th. You can get tickets on uh, Eventbrite. Um, they're £10 on the day or £7 if you buy them from uh, Eventbrite uh, before the event. Right. Now, somebody is uh, already talking about this in the chat box, that uh, the government is crowing and it's our defence uh, procurement uh, minister, Harriet, who's pictured there, is crowing because um, uh, there has been an £82 million contract awarded, uh, which is all to do with uh, night vision and uh, sighting aids. Uh, so she's got very, very excited about this, and she says it's a ple pleasure to announce the £82 million contract here at IDEX. This deal will provide our troops with the equipment they need to stay safe while also delivering £47 million of savings. Now, she's particularly excited because this benefits Welsh industry, um, but we're going to get the equipment to see the enemy, Mike, uh, but we don't actually have the aircraft carriers or the aircraft to go on them. We don't have the attack submarines. Um, we don't have the harpoon surface-to-surface -surface missiles. We don't have the engineers. We don't have the new ship orders. But not to worry because we're going to be able to see the enemy better. So let's just bring in the other part of it here. Should come up on screen. Um, this contract is made possible by our 178 billion equipment plan supported by a defence budget that will rise every year until the end of the decade. So we're spending 178 billion, but apparently under her procurement ministry, we can't actually provide the equipment we need. Well, um, Brian, it seems last week when we discussed the F-35, uh, we made a mistake. I'm sure that's not possible, Mike. Well, apparently the F-35 didn't earn a 15 to one kill ratio, as we said, it actually earned a 20 to one kill ratio. And I just wanted to highlight this UK Defence Journal article, um, just to say uh, nothing else other than this is pure propaganda from UK Defence Journal because all they have done is to uh, push out the uh, Lockheed Martin propaganda on the event. Right. Um, so this is a Lockheed Martin article from the uh, f35.com website, which is their website, um, and it's very slightly reworded on right. the UK Defence Journal article. There's no uh, investigation into what the reality of this w was. They have ignored uh, the comments regarding the requirement for uh, uh, close protection for these aircraft, and it is purely a positive story. Um, and, well, let's uh, restate that again, because that article said that originally it could achieve a 15 to 1 kill ratio, but that could only happen if the F-35, which is a fighter, was protected by another fighter, uh, the F-22. So, Which is a previous generation fighter. Which is a previous generation. So the F-35, the latest and greatest fighter, which the UK may get, but it hasn't got at the moment, but the Americans say, don't worry, this fighter's excellent, provided you've got another fighter to be there to protect it. 
It's Alice in Wonderland, Mike, and we're having a particularly Alice in Wonderland uh, news today. And the beauty is we're not making this up. Um, well, let's keep uh, Alice in Wonderland going then, because this is the Express. Uh, Britain's economy boomed after Brexit vote. UK GDP revised up to 0.7% in quarter four. So boomed is in capital letters because that's the important thing. Britain's economy is booming, absolutely booming, uh, or is it? Uh, well, in fact, uh, the, this is the Office for National Statistics who have raised their assessment of uh, quarter four performance of the economy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they had to bring down their assessment of the annual GDP numbers. Um, so that didn't work out too well as regards the Express headline. Um, but, you know, if we're really going to look at uh, booming GDP figures, uh, let's have a look at what China did in the same period. Quarter four, 6.8%, uh, uh, beating expectations, um, you know, for of 6.7%. So, so, you know, that's the relative uh, performance situation. It's not so good. In the meantime, the Treasury Select Committee was meeting last night, and they were speaking to uh, Mark Carney of the Bank of England, uh, and they were also speaking to Andy Haldane and some other people. Uh, Mark Carney said, well, actually, it's all OK because uh, uh, we're going to see faster growth following Brexit, uh, but only if there's a proper trade deal put in place uh, as soon as possible. The sooner, the better. We need a proper, bold, uh, ambitious trade deal. Uh, and this scenario, he said, is uh, then con consistent with faster growth relative to forecast and tighter monetary policy relative to forecast. So I'm sure you understand what that means. It seems perfectly clear to me. Um, so there you go. We're going to do really well. Uh, but uh, he said that, um, uh, sorry, Andy Haldane then ref also said that. He said that, that the uh, Brexit vote was going to have a very modest impact on growth. Now, uh, Mark Carney was challenged about the, 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 the forecast that they made prior to the, uh, the vote. Uh, and basically, he said, well, you know, it's a bit difficult to make a proper forecast when there's so many variables. Um, so Isn't that his job? You would have thought so. But he, he squirmed a little bit, didn't really have much to say about it, about why he had made statements prior to the, uh, the Brexit so vote, which turned out to be untrue. When a Canadian national sits in front of uh, Parliament talking about we, who is he talking about? Is he talking about Canada? Is he talking about the international banking system? Uh, yes, the is he talking banking about system. The, yeah, so he's not actually there for our benefit no right i wonder whether we could just jump back to the uh this slide i was particularly interested in if we pop this one up on uh people can think i'm joking here but i'm not i noticed in the background that either somebody uh, had decided to repaint the room and was using a paint testing kit and trying out some different colors or what we've got on the wall of that room is artwork which is designed to depress and demoralize people is that the state of Britain that artwork? I think it probably is. Yeah, uh, no doubt it was funded by the British Council. So uh, where do we go now? Well, thank you very much to the lady who said, um, "Heads up, this is coming." So here's the government uh, saying that there's going to be a debate about the role of fathers in the quote family unit. I thought people lived in families, but they're now family units, a work unit, a death unit, family unit. Uh, the debate, uh, the role of fathers in the family unit is going to be sponsored by Neil Gray MP, and that's going to be in the Westminster Hall on Wednesday, the 1st of March at 4.30. Now, we're still waiting for the details to come out, but I thought it was interesting that a British Parliament that at the moment is, uh, uh, has whips that were boasting of the paedophile activity and that they were covering that up, is the same Westminster which is going to advise fathers on how to behave in their family, quote, unit. So here's Mr. Gray. Um, we decided to have a little look at him. And uh, he's obviously very big on SMP. Uh, but we noticed that um, on his Twitter page, he was uh, retweeting another tweet that was getting very excited about a conference in Istanbul. And this is all about stopping violence uh, to women, uh, for women and children. Um, well, we're going to come on to that. Uh, but uh, they, the tweet said that they were very excited that Emma Watson had come on board. Now, I had to say, have to say I didn't know who Emma was, so I followed the link through. And then I find this. Now, I understand that this is 
the young lady was child actress from Harry Potter, a film on witchcraft. And I don't know what I'm looking at at the top of her Twitter page, but I don't like it. Um, promotion of the dark arts, is she dancing with the devil? I don't know. But apparently we should all relax because the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development is looking after our well-being. And we've got a Harry Pot Potter actress who is now going to save women and children from abuse. Yes. OK, so if we put that into context, this was the way it went. UK Parliament to an MP. Uh, he's getting very excited that we have a Harry Potter actress who's going to be fighting for children and, uh, and, and women who've been abuse victims. Um, we're just bringing no to named person because, of course, it's Scotland that's desperately saying that the state is going to take control of children. Uh, and one Scottish MP is on record as saying to parents, well, don't worry, because although the, the named person scheme is coming in, don't worry, because parents will also have a role in bringing up their children. And then I just wanted to bring in the sheer hypocrisy, because, of course, uh, Holly Gregg raped and abused as a young child. Uh, absolutely no justice in Scotland at all. In fact, the opposite, that the people who've campaigned for the perpetrators of that abuse to, to, uh, to be dealt with have themselves been put into prison. So I don't, I, <laughs> I'm going to pause here and laugh, Mike, because I've run out of ways of explaining this. We are watching utter chaos uh, ensue out of Westminster, people who are living in a different reality, possibly they're on drugs or drink, um, but is it any wonder that we're seeing the country fall apart at the moment? I don't think it is. OK, well, we will leave it there, we'll allow you to think about today's news. And uh, we'll just say that um, uh, we're very sad that um, Alex Thompson's wife is very poorly at the moment. So we've, we, we will not be able to have Alex joining us for a while. But our thoughts go out to him and his, him and his wife at the moment. And also to say thank you very much to people who have taken up an, a, a subscription with UK Column. We always have to ask because we need these subscriptions uh, to keep our news going. So if you like what we do, please subscribe or donate um, as we can only do what we do with your help. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back same time tomorrow. Bye bye.